Hey guys, it's Bob Morielli here with the Tuning School, and today I'm talking with Brian Tooley from Brian Tooley Racing, and uh, we're going to go ahead and discuss detonation tendencies relative to cylinder heads and cylinder head design. So it's going to be really interesting. Stick around and check it out. Hey guys, welcome back. We're talking today here with Brian Tooley. Thanks for chatting with us again, Mr. Brian. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, if you guys have been watching the last couple of videos in our Force Induction series of uh, Tech Tuesdays, uh, you'll remember last time we talked about uh, making this video specifically about detonation tendencies relative to cylinder heads. So uh, you're in the right place. Mr. Brian here is going to share his wisdom with us on the subject here. So Brian, talk to us a little bit. Expound on this for me. Okay. Yeah. Obviously. You know, there's several things obviously that contribute to detonation. Uh, number one, poor fuel uh, or maybe airflow, air fuel quality into the chamber. If your your port design is bad, um, some of these heads that have a the anti mixture motion damage column like an LS7 head has. Some of those heads are bad at causing the fuel to um, collect right at that dam, and, uh, and, and it's right. knocking the fuel out of suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. You know those can cause problems when you when you look at uh, detonation and, and air fuel quality in the cylinder. You you have to look at you know we we've, we've got this cylinder and we're trying to get an equal amount of air fuel ratio all the way across the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And what happens is even the the direction that the intake port is introduced into the combustion chamber affects that yes and, and so what i'm going to say is i'm going to draw two uh two things here now can you see this yes go ahead so let's let's do small block chevy first okay intake valve is here you've got a straight wall and um and then you've got this wall mm -hmm. then let's draw an ls an ls is kind of just the opposite right yes what happens in the small block chevy is it's almost like pouring water in a bucket okay so you've got the air fuel coming in, and it tends to centrifuge out to the cylinder walls. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you put the cylinder head on a uh, flow bench um, and measure swirl, you'll see a small, small like Chevy head swirl its butt off. Mm -hmm. But we would really have to step back one step and talk about flow bench, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, we had a flow data flow bench and we had a super flow 600 flow bench both at trip flow mm -hmm. and we would flow the same head back to back on both benches some heads would be within one percent some heads would be as much as ten percent off bench to bench wow. right which was one of the most amazing things i ever saw yeah and so i looked at the design of the flow data which has a very straight down it has a air filter it uses which acts as a diffuser mm -hmm. And so it pulls the air straight down. It does, yeah. Superflow, you've got that metal plate, you've got a plexiglass plate, and it tends to pull the air off to the side. Yes. So I said, I'll bet if you take cylinder heads and fall back to back on both benches and measure the swirl, mm. you'll see huge differences in swirl. Right. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. Yep. But here's the next thing we did. You should be able to put a swirl meter on the float bench mm -hmm. with no head on it, Turn that flow bench on, intake or exhaust, right. and that swirl meter shouldn't swirl. Right. It move, right? Right. On a flow data flow bench, it will not move. Right. A swirl meter on a Superflow 600 mm -hmm. with no head attached it's gonna move. will swirl its ass off. Mm -hmm. Because of the direction they're pulling the air through. Because the direction is pulling the air. Yep. A Superflow 600 is not a good cylinder, it's not a good flow bench to develop cylinder heads on. Mm -hmm. I know that hurts everybody's feelings because everybody's got one. It's the industry standard. It's not a good flow bench to develop cylinder heads on. Mm -hmm. So before we talk about swirl, we have to talk about flow bench. So anyway, back to swirl. So, uh, and then in the LS, um, it tends to not have as much swirl, but the other thing is the direction of raw fuel flow. Right. You know, small watch Chevy, if you've got raw fuel flow going this direction, guess where it's at? Mm -hmm. It's against the solar wall. In an LS, if you've got it going straight, guess where it's at? Right in the center. It's the center of the cylinder. Sure. Okay? So your airflow quality, your air fuel ratio quality going into the combustion chamber, step number one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also why I hate big block Chevys, because a big block Chevy has, you know, Works. two of these on each side of the engine. Yep. 
you know, you got four intake ports doing one thing and four intake ports doing a different thing. Right. I hate them. Yeah. Unless you've got a symmetrical port, big block shaky head. Right. So now we would have to talk about sharp edges. Uh, that's kind of a, a no brainer there. Sure. Uh, if your piston has sharp edges anywhere, that's bad. If your combustion chamber has sharp edges anywhere, that's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of these uh, dish pistons and where they cut the dish, uh, and then there's the Yep. Uh, landing to the to the flat on the edge. Yep. There's a sharp edge there. The yep. vibro leaves are sharp edges. Yep. That's all bad. You've yep. got to get rid of all of that stuff. Yep. Um, and the next thing is is the combustion chamber itself. Now, when you look at you know a combustion chamber, you know you got your intake and exhaust valves. You know you tend to have a quench pad, um, mm -hmm. obviously on, on this side um, of the cylinder head. You know this is your exhaust port going out. Um, so you, you have a quench pad here, and then some of these heads obviously have a quench pad yeah. on this other side, right? Yeah. Like a 317 head may not have a quench pad over here. An LS6 head may have a nice straight quench pad. Um, an LS3 head, for example, has, uh, in my opinion, one of the worst quench pads ever put on uh, an LS engine because what it does is it, it's got this little squiggly thing uh, right above the spark plug area. Right. And, and the other thing, when you look at it from the side, you know, if this is the, uh, if this is the intake valve, uh, this is the deck, you know, where this chamber comes up over here to the deck, and this is almost a 90 degree angle there. Yep. You know, so what we do when we work on these combustion chambers, the first thing we do is we take this squiggly line and we'll take a, a straight edge or a, a a, a gallon paint can or whatever and it's got a nice radius and we actually straighten out yeah that um that quench pad yeah right of course i'm not drawing it very straight but, that's you know, okay straight and uh and of course then the next thing we do is we come in here and we radius this off mm -hmm. to where there's no sharp edge yep well the because you you have to understand you know what is happening on these quench pads as they meet the piston Right. That that quench pad and that piston, when they both come flat together, particularly on this side, mm -hmm. where it may actually be lean in the chamber for fuel, because a lot of your fuel is over here. Sure. This self ignites. Yes. You know, a, a great story I like to tell. I'm a I'm an old submarine guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had 4,500 psi air system on the submarine. Mm -hmm. If you had a, a an airline that was at zero pressure and you had a valve and you had the 4,500 PSI supply over here, if you open that valve too quickly, yeah. you could blow up the submarine. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't realize if you've got, if you've got uh, oil in the air, in that case, if you've got, you know, an air fuel ratio to combust, sure. if you bring it to pressure too quickly, yep. it self ignites. Yep. That's what happens on these quench pads. Yeah. So just reducing the size of the quench pads, obviously reduces the chance of detonation. Now you see, you know, a lot of guys are doing these, um, you know, the CNC program, they, they've got a four degree uh, dish and they're coming here and they're cutting this whole quench pad Back. at a four degree um, angle, you know, to reduce the size of the quench pad. Um, but if they, if they actually use that quench pad, um, Rather than just simply, you know, doing this thing, if they actually started doing this thing, if they actually start laying this side of the quench pad back, mm -hmm. so we we're actually angling the airflow in, yeah, the airflow toward the exhaust valve, yeah, you'll actually make more power. Sure. You See, know. that only makes sense because um, you, people think about it. <laughs> versus people just making changes for the heck of it, which we see way too much. Right. Yeah. And, and this is, quite honestly, this is what we do. You know, uh, a lot of people are familiar with Jesse Coulter's real street car. Mm -hmm. um, this past weekend, he made the fastest pass of class. He went almost 184 miles per hour. Yeah, that's right. I had seen that. Single, single 76 turbo. Yeah. Now, I probably shouldn't put this out there. That engine is 12.91 compression. It runs 26 degrees of timing. Wow. At 20 some pounds of boost. Wow. It'll run all season without putting a head gasket on it. That's amazing. 
That's pretty amazing if you ask me. Yep. Reducing detonation is how that's possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you've looked into these, and this, this is going to be a plug, okay? It's not a shameless plug, but it is relative to what we're talking about here. But we, we have been recently talking to guys uh, through our Tech Tuesday videos and whatnot about the Plex knock monitors. And um, in the case of something like this, it could be very, very helpful because instead of just relying on a factory knock sensor or the factory ECM to determine what is or is not, it's a device that I think is going to be like the next wideband to everybody's, you know, dyno setup because it allows you to audibly hear normal engine noise and then real detonation and you see a noise floor and you see exactly what's going on and in a case like this i mean i don't know if it can keep you on the same set of head gaskets all season that's huge um but i don't know i just wanted to put that out there because I, I keep telling people i'm telling people that you know regardless you need to get something like this because it is like the next thing it's, it's like a wideband for your toolbox you, you need to have that on the dyno because I, I i've saved the c7 using it that would be awesome to have. Absolutely. Will you hang on one second, Brian? I need to hook in my battery real quick. All right. I think everything's still just as we had it. Um, so we were talking about quench, sharp areas. We are talking about detonation. Um, so the quench pad itself is relative to detonation. Right. Yeah. And, and reducing the size of the quench pad is what's important. Mm hmm Okay. And so is there such a thing as uh, too little quench pad? Too little quench pad, no. Okay. Not, not in my opinion. Okay. If you look at a top fuel Hemi engine, mm -hmm. it has a zero push pad. Okay. Um, that makes perfect sense. And that's that's a good engine to mention in terms of solar head design because, you know, we talked about swirl and where the fuel ends up and all this other crap. Well, when you got your intake port here and your valve intake valve here and everything is going straight, you have almost no swirl. Okay. You have no centrifuge. You'll end up with some tumble, mm -hmm. but you don't have you know the fuel right. centrifuging itself out to the summer walls sure. like you might in a small block Chevy and, and some other applications. And is it your your opinion that swirl really isn't something to look at on the performance side, but really is more for the economy side from <laughs> factory perspective, I suppose? You, you know, it's it used to be uh, the OEMs tried to get swirl mm -hmm. to keep the air fuel ratio homogenized. Right. Um, but um, once they realized that swirl could centrifuge the fuel out the solar walls, mm -hmm. uh, once that fuel is centrifuged out, right. you know, and the rings are, are scraping it, uh, man, those hydrocarbons go right out the exhaust port. Sure. You know, so that's why you see some of this new stuff, you know, they're actually doing stuff to reduce swirl. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep, obviously, the, the air fuel suspension. mixture homogenized. Right. Of course, now you're drilling, drilling direct injected it, and so, right. you know, you know, the homogenization is taken a little uh, different itself. A little bit different. That's another topic for another video, I suppose. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, I've been through that one. Um, all right. So, and uh, what's next on our hit list with uh, detonation in the combustion chamber? Um, have you worked with coatings much? You know, honestly, I have not worked with coatings at all. Ah. Well, I can give you a little bit of input, and I, I think you should test it. That's what I think. Um, but we actually used to do ceramic coatings in an old business. And uh, when we did our testing, uh, we found that if you were to take a, you know, a heat source and direct it at a piston top, that piston top would absorb the heat at that single source, and it was very bad at, at deflecting the heat over the whole surface. And so um, what we did was we'd, we'd set the ceramic coating over the whole top of the piston. And to be really effective, we do the whole combustion chamber and the valve faces. And people, you know, sometimes people argue it and they go, oh, it's a waste of money or, you know, you don't really need to do that. Okay, yeah, you don't need to do that. But when we did it, we found that it took the heat and just evenly dispersed it over the whole surface. And so that was able, that allowed us to run a couple cars on pump gas at 13 to 1 um, uh, compression ratios. So I looked at that and said, hey, that's that's kind of a good thing. That's that's a winner. Um, that's so, fair. You know, if you want to spend the money, you can get the results. It's just a question yeah. of do you really want to spend the money? That's interesting. Yeah. and, and we'll have to test that now. You, sh you should definitely test it. I'll tell you. I mean, uh, we're, we're not super scientific in our methods, but at the same time, uh, we were able to uh, measure temperature over the whole surface and determine that, you know, once the um, once the piston got, got that heat source attached to it, the coating dispersed the heat evenly over the whole surface. So it allowed us to run more compression, 
or you know in this case more boost it allowed us to run more of it without that same detonation factor um, and you know applying to the combustion chamber and the valve faces those were all huge gains for us when we were playing with it but uh, you should you should play with it man there's um, a company called Techline Coatings uh, okay. check them out there you, you can buy smaller quantities test it yourself and when we were when we were uh, doing our very very first testing and we had nothing for you know ovens and everything uh, we actually went down to a local uh, appliance, used appliance store, and bought a $35 oven, if you can imagine, a $35 oven. We put a PLC controller on the thing, uh, you know, because Larry, our engineer Larry, he's, he's, that's his background. So we had a digital controller on a $35 oven with new elements and reinforced it. And here we are for 50 bucks. Now we're up and running like professionals. But, uh, and then you can bake it. You can bake a set of cylinder heads in a standard oven, and that's all it takes to uh to really do that test so i would encourage any of you guys that are you know interested give it a try it's in our opinion it was really worthwhile uh coatings anyway so ceramic coatings on the combustion chambers and the piston tops and i think the oems are doing some of that now too i, I think they're doing it on the skirts primarily for drag reduction right i, I would love to test it back to back for power yeah absolutely that's interesting yeah it, it was worthwhile for it, us i could see it making more power because you know power is all about heat mm -hmm. and if you keep the heat in the combustion process and out of the chamber and out of the piston yep should make more power you know we saw some interesting byproducts because a lot of our customers are road course racers and um at the time we were doing the testing we found their coolant temps would drop as a result of it because that heat wasn't you know transmitting through yeah. to the water jackets uh, which was good for them and they were making better power and, and also on uh less spark advance so when we see something with less spark advance making the same or better power that's that's usually a winner for us right yeah yeah that was that was big so uh what else do you see we talked about uh sharp edges uh we've talked about uh the fuel entry points how that's effective swirl and things of that nature fuel quality obviously really really important uh anything else you can think of in the cylinder head world um you know in terms of detonation um i mean you obviously you know, the things we haven't mentioned, which is pretty obvious to everybody, you know, spark plug choice. Sure. Extended tip versus non-projected tip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, as you make more and more heat, uh, you have no choice but run a cooler and cooler, you know. Plug. Yeah, plug with a non-extended tip. Have you done any, any testing on the, um, the material of the plug? Because, like, in our experience, when we would run something like a platinum plug in the turbo motor, we would detonate really early and because I, I suspect that would do with the heat, the, the temperature retained on the tip of that platinum uh, plug. I have not, but I could, I could see that. Yeah, that thing probably uh, glows almost. I suspect it does. But I, there's a reason that the OEMs went to that, and that it's not for performance. I suspect it's for longevity. Right, yeah. yeah you, you have to realize that so much the OEM does is about uh, emissions mm -hmm. and economy. Yes, absolutely. Nothing really relative to what we're trying to do today. Yeah, uh, direct injection, perfect example. People think, oh, direct inject it, that, that'll make more power. Mm -hmm. No, that will not make more power. Right. You know, the sooner um, the sooner you introduce the, the fuel in the airstream, right. uh, the more time the fuel will, you know, have that latent heat of evaporation cooling effect on the intake charge. Right. You know, and that's what kills me about injector placement. People are like, or where should I put my injector? It's like, well, if you want to make a bunch of power, you put the injector all the way at the uh, entry of the uh, intake runner. Yep. Yeah. Idle drivability will be terrible, <laughs> but it'll make a lot of power. It will. Yeah. Absolutely. Will. Absolutely. Well, thank you for chatting with us today, Mr. Brian. Okay. We've had an excellent discussion. I appreciate you guys watching, and uh, have a good day, Brian. Thanks for your help. All right. You too. Thanks. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.